Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our study of the Book of Origins, Genesis. My name is John Walker, and I'm sitting with Bruce Wasek, the minister of the Princeton Church of Christ. Bruce, uh, where are we in our study, and what would be helpful as we consider picking up uh, in this Genesis journey? We're ready to begin chapter 6 of uh, Genesis, and the first four verses are said by many scholars to be obviously the most difficult passage in Genesis, but one of the most difficult passages in the entire Old Testament to interpret. But I think as we'll see, it's not so much that this passage is difficult to interpret as that the logical interpretation when done in light of the culture of the ancient Middle East uh, is so contrary to our own way of seeing things that we tend to think that such things as are discussed in the first few verses are mythological rather than historical and real. Now in our study thus far, remember we started off with a key to understanding Genesis chapter one as a restoration of creation, what depended on understanding of chapter 1, verse 2, where it said the earth was empty and formless. And we noted at the time that the only other times these two descriptive words were used in the Old Testament, they referred to the catastrophic results of a conflict and the aftermath of it, which therefore would suggest to the readers of this uh, text uh, to begin with that some kind of conflict would have gone on to leave the earth in this kind of form. And so we expounded what I would call the, war, uh, the warfare worldview. We noted that in all the ancient Mesopotamian stories, uh, they claimed that the gods had been at war with one another uh, at, before they engaged in making the earth a habitable place and then placing human beings uh, on the earth. And so the biblical account would seem to agree with that. We would think about the war between the rebellious angels, the fallen angels, and the godly ones might have had catastrophic impact on the earth. And yet God restored the earth in order to place his image bearers there to be his official representatives. Now, God had a specific role in mind for human beings. He wanted them to rule over creation and function in a priestly fashion over the earth uh, to create an environment where human beings could fellowship with God uh, as they did in the garden, as well as have access to the tree of life so that uh, death would not be an imminent reality uh, for the human life. But in order for human beings to functionally be rulers, priestly rulers over creation, they had to develop in wisdom, they had to develop in character, they had to develop uh, to a more mature state than they were to begin with. And so God uh, has a selective couple out of all the human beings that he places in the garden to be a representative couple. And uh, they then began the process of moral and spiritual growth. It starts off with, who are you going to listen to as the source of wisdom? God or the serpent? Uh, whose instructions are you going to follow to try to find true wisdom uh, to mature and to grow up? And one point of wisdom is that when something is wrong, something is forbidden, something is prohibited, it's for our own good that it's prohibited. And so Adam and Eve discovered the hard way uh, when they ate the forbidden fruit. Uh, I think God intended to work with Adam and Eve and restore them, uh, but they refused to accept reasonable responsibility for their action but blame shifted it on to someone else. And so you can't help people that refuse to take responsibility for
for their action. You have to let them suffer the consequences. And God spelled out the consequences, one of which was exile from the garden, where they could no longer have such intimate relationship with God and where they no longer had access to the tree of life. So now death became a reality for all of them. Well, Cain comes along, and at least Eve thinks he's going to be the firstborn hero child that's going to restore uh, them to the garden, uh, hopefully overcome the dilemma that they're in, where they're working by the sweat of their brow. Uh, but he turns out to be much less than a hero. God doesn't accept his sacrifice, but his younger brother, he does. And Cain's response to that isn't, Lord, what do I need to do? to repent and change and to do the right thing so that I can offer sacrifices acceptable to you. Instead, his response is to become angry, uh, obviously angry at God, but he displaces his anger onto his brother as if the fact his brother offered an acceptable sacrifice was a terrible thing his brother did, like his brother was intentionally shaming and deriding him by offering a right sacrifice to the Lord. The Lord comes down, as he did with Adam and Eve, and counsels with Cain. God wants to prevent Cain from going down the road to destruction. And uh, Cain refuses to interact with God, where his parents at least interacted after they sinned. Uh, finally, God warns him, and this is the first mention of sin in the Bible, Sin is not a violation of the rules. It's not simply doing this and not doing that. But sin is a personal force of evil that he says is crouching at the very door of the house of Cain. And if he goes out with the intent to, uh, in anger, to kill his brother, then sin will pounce on him. And uh, sin's desire is for him. Sin wants to dominate and control human beings. And if we cooperate with them, they can. But then he tells uh, Cain, you can rule over it or master it. In other words, you have free will. You don't have to do what your angry emotions are driving you in the direction of. And I warn you that if you go down that road, you will be dominated and controlled by this personal force of evil, the Bible calls sin. And of course, we know the story. He disregarded God's counsel. He took him out in a field almost as if, well, let me get him out of God's purview out here, out in the field. Let me kill him, and then I'll be done with that. But God comes down and questions him again. And now we have a worse response than Adam and Eve. Uh, he... Uh, lied and got to do, uh, where's your brother a chance to confess the truth and what he'd done and he said I don't know he knew exactly what had taken place on where his brother was but he lied and then he even made a sarcastic comment you know am I my brother's keeper like he's an animal in a cage and I'm keeper over him like Adam and Eve kept the garden I'm going to keep him as if the answer was obviously not uh, king, but God said, I can hear the voice of the blood of your brother crying out from the ground, of course, seeking justice. And only after he pointed that out <clears throat> and then enumerated the consequences to this. Look, you've been tilling the soil here just east of Eden, able to approach the garden to make sacrifice, uh, but now you're going to become a wanderer. You're no longer going to be able to till this land you've tilled, and it produced for you as it has before. You're going to be forced into a wanderer on the earth. And only after all of that had taken place did uh, he finally engage God in conversation. And basically, it was a lot of self-pity. Oh, it's too hard for me, this punishment you have given me besides now here's projection oh anybody that comes across me because they know i'm a killer they'll kill me now what's the chance of just somebody knows you're a killer they're going to kill you this is kind of a paranoia 
but it's a paranoia that comes about when you commit evil and you're aware of the potential of evil in other people and you imagine they're going to do to you as you have done to your brother. And so God says, I'll give you a mark, you know, they won't uh, attack you or I'll avenge you seven times. And so he wanders out. He goes, I said, to land of Nod, which is a word for nothingness. So he's going beyond the habitable area that you can cultivate into more nomadic environment uh, uh, as he has become a wanderer. He marries a wife. Where's Cain's wife come from? Probably, as we said to begin with, uh, Genesis 1, verse 26 says God created a, a variety of, of Adams and later created Ha-Adam. So there were other people on the earth besides the family of Ha-Adam. And so he begins to wander off. He begins to go on his way. Um, but sin has made its impact on the world. And seven generations down from Cain, we discover uh, Lamech who is a violent, boastful, arrogant, uh, threatener of his wives, a polygamist. Uh, things are not going well for the descendants of Cain. Meanwhile, another son is born to Adam, Seth, and his line of descendants, seven down, show a spiritual side to them, where Cain's descendants all, all are about building the material culture of civilization. Uh, Seth's descendants are about a spiritual relationship, about calling on the name of the Lord. It's about uh, uh, walking with God. And it said Enoch walked with God, and God took him. And so here is one man out of the human race that got back in sync with God. To such an extent, he was not uh, seen to have to die before he saw God, but God takes him directly. Uh, into the heavens. And so there's one individual that has avoided uh, death, one individual that has seen immortality. Uh, and so the opposite between the seventh generation of Cain and seventh of Seth is very outstanding. And then it goes on, Seth's descendants to go to the tenth generation where Noah appears. And of course, we saw that Adam. Uh, family uh, continues. Uh, we are now to the sixth chapter, where up to now, besides the activity of Eve and what she thinks and says, there's been little conversation about the daughters of Ha'adam. What, what have they been doing in the meanwhile? Uh, have they been seeking the face of God, if they've been walking with God, if they've been calling on his name, or have they been caught up in another uh, rebellion against God? And I think that's where our story picks up in Genesis chapter 6, uh, the first four verses. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of the humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. Bruce, um, where does Hadam show up? Well, how does he occur here? And what should we remember about these ancient stories? Um, interestingly enough, in this context, when it starts off, verse 1, when human beings began to increase their men upon the earth, it's not the normal word Adam or another word for a generic word for men, but it's Ha-Adam. So this is talking about the descendants of Adam and Eve, not all the rest of the human race. And when it talks about the daughters of men, it's the daughters of Ha-Adam. And later, my spirit will not always contend or remain with Ha-Adams. So again, it brings back into the conversation 
the special representative family of Adam and Eve and their descendants who were given a special opportunity uh, to grow under God's guidance and discipline and direction and wisdom. And of course, as we've seen, they wandered far from the direction God would have them grow. And here it tells us how the, their daughters, the women, got entangled in uh, inappropriate relationships. And later we'll read about the catastrophic uh, results of that. Now, what this reminds us of in the ancient world, let's remember that uh, in the ancient Mesopotamian stories, it was always talking about people leading up to uh, a great flood that destroyed the ancient world. And of course, we're fixing to embark on that. It talks about all the men of renown that lived before the flood. They're given astronomically long years as kings and rulers, according to the Sumerian kings list. Uh, Gilgamesh uh, was a, a hero of old that founded one of the great cities of the ancient world. Uh, he was said to be part human and part uh, divine. Um, and there was in the mythology of the ancient world, the fact that men were seeking immortality and that one human being, uh, they give him a name that's hard to pronounce since I won't try to burden you with that. But the point is they named this one man and many of them tried to seek his counsel so they might have immortality. And this, uh, this man uh, clearly alludes to what the Bible says. There was one such man, and his name was Enoch. Uh, so we have some background, I think, to this in the Mesopotamian literature. You know, everything that's said in that is not uh, absolutely true, but they remember certain things that they uh, recreate in their stories that are part and parcel of the ancient history uh, of human beings. So I think that's helpful uh, to understand initially uh, what this text might be saying. And as mentioned, who are these sons of God? Yeah, so in interpreting this passage, you have a number of problematic issues. How do we interpret sons of God? Uh, what does it mean my spirit won't remain but uh, 120 years, two of the Nephilim? So there are a number of, of questions that we have to answer before we can get the, mm -hmm. the meaning. So the first question is, who are the sons of God? Now, uh, more recently in history, uh, they there's been a tendency to interpret this as the godly line of Seth. Thus, they were sons of God. So using it in a way that the New Testament would refer to children of God or sons of God as being the righteous and moral. And thus the opposite would be uh, the uh, daughters of men would be Cain's descendants. And so the daughters on that side. Uh, some have even read into this. The, the expression son of God was sometimes used to refer to a king as it does to uh, King David and Solomon in uh, the Hebrew text. Um, but the Hebrew text doesn't really refer to the nation of Israel as the sons uh, of God. So instead, what we find is that the Old Testament uses expression sons of God uh, exclusively uh, to refer to angels. It has other expressions for the angels and other spiritual beings, the host of heaven and other expressions. <clears throat> but let's look at one such example for that. It's found that uh, there are two references to it in the book of Job, but we'll just look at one of them, and there are other places in the Old Testament. But just so we remember, uh, Job 1, uh, verse 6. One day, the, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. So remember, this is this is the setting in heaven, the courtroom of heaven, the convenes, and the and uh, literally it says the sons of God. Our modern translations have even taken the expression and knowing what it likely means have translated it in our translation, angels. But literally it said the sons of God. 
Um, so angels were understood to be the sons of God. They were the immortals who were supposed to be working in sync with God, uh, working with his creation. Uh, but here in these verses, it envisions these sons of God as leaving their role as helping humans and becoming, as we find elsewhere, angels can take on human form. They not only took on human form, uh, but because they found uh, the daughters of Adam beautiful, they took whoever they wanted uh, and married them and had children. Uh, this is a violation of their role. And so one of the reasons that I believe the sons of God refers to angels is elsewhere in the Old Testament, that's its meaning. Number two, when the Greek translation, the Septuagint was made before the first century, it translated the sons of God here as angels. So it understood that to be its meaning. Uh, the early uh, literature written by the Jews before the time of Christ, one book is known as First Enoch. It understands this whole text as referring to the rebellion of angels against God's will who came down and had children who were known as the Nephilim and who brought great violence on the earth. And these angels that violated this were punished and have already been punished by God. Uh, and First Enoch talks all about this. It's not the only Jewish text to do so. Uh, all the early Christian interpretations thought of these as angels violating their role. So I'll go with those. And let's also note the New Testament understands this to be the case. There's uh, a quote out of the book of Jude that clearly alludes to this uh, situation. Verse 6, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he would, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Uh, a little later, it actually quotes one verse out of the book of First Enoch. Uh, to substantiate its point. But notice here, it says uh, that the angels didn't keep their proper role and authority, but abandoned them, uh, and they have been punished. Now, what kind of a, a sin did they commit? Well, in a similar way, it says Sodom and Gomorrah engaged mm -hmm. in sexual immorality. So this was the same kind of abnormal uh, sexual immorality. And that's the, at the root of the sin of the angels, uh, choosing whichever women they would to marry. And the idea could very well be not just one woman, but maybe a multiplicity of wives. Uh, so the sons of God are picking over the daughters of Hiazab and taking the best uh, that they find for their wives and leaving whoever's left uh, to uh, the remaining men to get married. Uh, also in 2 Peter chapter 2, also alludes to this, I think. Verses 4 and 5. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the, the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, so, again, just an allusion to the time of Noah and angels again who were punished for what they did. Now, there's no other possible inference of angels being involved in anything improper uh, in any other possible place than Genesis 6. So I think the New Testament got it right. I think the early Jewish writings got it right. The early Christian writers of the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century got it right. And I think later interpreters who were concerned that this sounded more like a myth because remember all the Greek myths and uh, other Mesopotamian myths talk about 
the gods coming down and having intercourse with human women in particular who had offspring that were a mixture of human and divine and how they were men of renown like a Hercules, etc. Mm-hmm. So I think these mythological remembrances are remembering something that actually happened uh, prior to the flood as the Bible records, and it created great havoc uh, on the earth. But now look at it another way. Uh, you're one of the daughters of Ha'adam. Who would you rather get married to? Would you marry a, an ordinary man to have ordinary offspring, or would you marry an immortal to have extraordinary children? So you can see the attraction maybe even her parents in arranging the marriage. Why should we marry her off to a ordinary mortal? So almost in a sense, by marrying these angels, they were looking for another shortcut way back to immortality. Hmm. But of course that did not happen. The angels were punished. And as we're going to see in the text, human beings still remained mortal, even the children of the sons of God and the daughters of men. Now, the only objection to this uh, angels being involved in in, in proper intercourse is some people say, well, Jesus said angels are non-sexual beings, and so this can't possibly be the case. So just for uh, considering that objection, we'll look at Mark chapter 12, where Jesus said something along that line. Beginning at verse 24, Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will, they will be like the angels in heaven. So, so this verse is saying that when we are resurrected from the dead, we'll be like the angels in that we will not be getting married. Uh, and so this has nothing about the potential of angels to take human form and engage inappropriately with sexual relationship. This talks about the natural state of angels when they remain in their proper state and that we too will be in that kind of state uh, after the resurrection. So I don't think this contradicts the idea that angels couldn't take human form and couldn't have children. It's just that that's inappropriate. It's not their natural, ordinary state and the righteous angels that serve God uh, did not do that and do not uh, do that. So just so you might know, there are some that object to this interpretation for that reason. The other major one is I think it sounds mythological. I would just say that it's affirming that some of the mythology of the ancient world was rooted in some truth. Not all their mythologies are true, not everything they say, but they are remembering true things and putting it into their own stories. So Bruce, going back to the text, what does the 120 years refer to? Yeah, this this is uh, uh, interesting. Uh, again, uh, what he says here is, God says, my spirit will not re- contend or remain with the uh, ha-adams forever. For they are flesh, and as our more modern translations translate, uh, that's suggesting that these uh, Ha'adam descendants, instead of gaining immortality by this uh, marriage with the angels, still remain mortal. They are going to die. Maybe a little, a little longer because of uh, this, uh, the children of these uh, uh, illicit uh, relationships. And God says, But I am not going to allow my spirit to remain uh, forever, but instead I'm limiting 120 years. And I think this could refer, some think this refers to God. God is now limiting the lifespan of human beings. Uh, We've already discussed the, the numbers of human beings and what the possibilities are there. But another understanding, which I would understand here, is this refers to the period of grace. I'm going to give 120 years before I execute my judgment 
on the human race for their rebellion against me. So Noah and his family has a period of time to prepare for the great flood that God is going to send on the earth. And so I think this is referring to that because at that point he's going to wipe out uh, most of the human race. Therefore, his spirit will not remain. So if we think of his spirit, we go back to Genesis 2, uh, verse 7, and we see that it's the spirit of God that gives us life. <clears throat> then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Yeah, uh, living being is Nephilim, but the breathe is the word spirit. He breathed into him the spirit of life. So it's talking about the spirit. And uh, to see the importance of the spirit giving life, we can look over to a passage in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. In chapter 36 and 37, he's talked about the resurrection of hope for Israel. He's talked about the valley of dry bones and how they reconstitute in the vision that Ezekiel sees and become human beings, fully human, resurrected from the dead. And then this statement is made in chapter 37 uh, of the book of Ezekiel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. So the Lord is promising resurrection hope and he's saying, when I put my spirit in you again. So you can reconstruct bodies uh, but without the Spirit of God, there is no life. And so that's the point here. He's removing the vital source of life, the Spirit, from them. And he's threatening to do this at the end of 120 years, which would mean a mass extinction of the descendants of Ha, Adam, who are failing to live up to God's intended purpose for them. And Bruce, can you go back and share with us a little more about the Nephilim? Now, this is very, very interesting. Um, you go to First Enoch and other Jewish writings, uh, and the Jews had a, a great deal to say about the Nephilim, which, who they understood to be the children of this illicit relationship between angels and women. Uh, they were obviously not just human. They were part human and part immortal. Uh, and... Uh, First Enoch and other writings said that they were engaged in, in great violence. So what happened is their angelic fathers, it says, taught them the arts of warfare. It taught them about witchcraft, taught them about all kinds, some beneficial herbs and things to use. Uh, so wisdom was imparted by these angels to the human beings. But unfortunately, because they were rebellious angels, these angels set up their fiefdoms and they in turn steered man in a more deviant path. And so violence escalated on the earth. And so in, in seeking the wisdom of God through the angels and being involved with them in a illicit affair, this again, like grabbing the fruit off the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil, a shortcut way to wisdom, turned out to be only worldly wisdom, ungodly wisdom that is self-destructive and destructive on the human race. So uh, that's how the Nephilim were understood by the Jews in their uh, later writings. And they also said that when the Nephilim were died or were killed, their spirits continued to live on on the earth. They didn't go where all the other spirits of human beings went and that they became the evil spirits and demons that tormented human beings in the future. Uh, and of course, saw it as their ultimate purpose to possess a body because they remembered what it was like to live in a body, to be a human, and it was more desirable 
than to be in this torturous strait of a wandering spirit with no place of permanence. Uh, so that's what the Jews understood to be the source of the demonic and evil spirits uh, that we see Jesus combating in, uh, in his ministry in a powerful way. Now, Nephilim, see the problem with interpreting Nephilim, I just give the uh, Hebrew word Nephilim, which is plural, um, is because it only occurs one other time, so twice in the Bible, this passage and one other. And so from those two passages, you can't understand exactly what is meant. But the other passage does help us, I think, a little bit. And if we turn to uh, Numbers, I believe, chapter 13, I believe verse 33, remember the context of this, God sent spies in the land of Canaan before they went in to explore it, bring back a report, what's the land like? And, of course, 10 of them brought back this report. Oh, you know, there are giants in the land, and it's, yes, it's a land of milk and honey, but they're fortified cities. We can't possibly take that land. Only Joshua and Caleb dared to believe that God could allow them to. But as a part, an influence of that report, verse 33 tells us something about what they saw when they were in the land of Canaan. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So here it says the Nephilim are still around on the earth. So evidently, uh, some of the descendants of these beings uh, continue to be around. So not everybody uh, died in the great flood uh, for there to be Nephilim on the earth. We'll talk more about that later when we talk about who died in the flood. But you notice in context here, it's saying these Nephilim were descended from a certain individual and that we appear like grasshoppers to them, which means they must have been very uh, 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 large in physical size, extraordinary strength and size. Uh, that's why the uh, Septuagint version translates the Nephilim as giants. So they interpreted this meaning to be giants, but obviously a special kind of, of giant. So these are the men of renown of the ancient world. And of course, all the other uh, ancient mythologies talk about these great men and name them that form great cities or great warriors. And of course, if the offshoot of angels and human beings might have extraordinary abilities, might have been counseled by their fathers into special insights into warfare, both spiritual and physical. So these, as the biblical texts, were the great men of renown. They were human beings, uh, but of course were mortal and died. They had descendants, and even down hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, when the Israelites are ready to enter the promised land, there's still some Nephilim uh, descendants of these, of this illicit relationship uh, in their day. So as we pretty much interpreted the key words here, uh, and so what is it saying? It's saying that, you know, angels, some of them rebelled against their, their responsible position and role, and uh, got involved with women and produced these unique offspring. Uh, but this didn't make the world a better place. Uh, it made a place where God uh, says, I'm just going to give them a short period of time in which to repent or perish. Uh, so here, the God who created the earth and placed the Ha'adam descendants, especially in the garden, intended to nurture them, is now saying things have gone so wrong that I'm now giving a time limit before I'm going to destroy the entire uh, group of descendants of Ha'adam. But to get a feel for that, we need to continue reading uh, the rest of our text today, uh, verses 5 through 8 in Genesis 6. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, 
and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Um, yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah uh, I, I was just going to say, um, it, it was just kind of a piggyback and pickup of what you missed, uh, mentioned about the illicit relationships uh, that resulted in these children. Uh, brother yeah. So look what happened. Uh, the Lord, and, and here it starts, I said, the Lord saw, which is to remind us earlier, God saw that as he restored creation, it was good. And even after human beings were made, he said, it is very good. Now God looks down and he doesn't see good. But with their free will, they human beings have willfully rebelled against God, have cooperated with rebellious angels and have created a disastrous uh, spiritual situation. It's so bad uh, that he says, uh, every inclination of the thoughts of the, of the human heart will only evil all the time. When evil sinks down deep in human hearts and controls the human hearts of people, dark and terrible things happen, you know, when sometimes people that are fairly good-hearted people may make mistakes and do things that are wrong, but when their heart goes rotten, when all of their thinking is about how we can do things that are devious and evil, then you have lost those people. Uh, they are beyond reach and beyond redemption. Um, but then we find something very interesting we're going to find in this context that discusses God's nature. Um, now, the modern text obscure what's said here because it goes against some of the theology of some of the translators. Like in verse 6, the Lord regretted that he had made ha uh, The word in Hebrew translated regretted is the Hebrew word repent or change of mind. Later, it repeats it in verse 7, uh, near the end of it, for I regret that I have made them. I repent, change my mind that I've made them. So God can change his mind. God can repent in that sense. He initially started on this project with uh, the special uh, creation of the Ha Adam to join the rest of the Adamic race. Uh, he gave them a special place. God worked with them in special ways to try to develop them into the kind of people that could be righteous rulers in God's place over creation who could subdue evil uh, with God's help and uh, make the planet all that it could be with God's help and human cooperation. But now God has decided to change his mind. I don't think this is going to work uh, through these individuals. And so I repent. Uh, the only good news is he says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So when God looked down and decided to destroy this, these descendants of Ha Adam, one of them stood out as a righteous character worthy of redemption, and that was Noah. And so the human race, as we go on, or the Ha Adam race, is going to be preserved by one family, uh, Noah's family, while the rest are going to be just wiped out, as he said, uh, or destroyed. But let's return to the idea that uh, God repented. Uh, it also said uh, that his, his heart, God's heart, was deeply troubled. This means not only can God change his mind, 
God can have and does have intense emotion. He has a gut level reaction to what we do and don't do. You know, God is deeply troubled and hurt when his creation goes bad, when sin dominates his, uh, his special image bearers and the image of God is erased in their lives and replaced by evil. And so the Old Testament and the New recognizes God has something comparable to our emotional state. God is not an unfeeling a deity far removed from the human drama, not according to the biblical text. Mm -hmm. But to give you a little further uh, detail on the idea of God repenting and changing his mind, there are two contexts I'd like us to look at. One is first Sam, I mean second Samuel. And uh, in this context, we'll look at two verses. Uh, this is talking about the fact that Saul has been made king, but of course that's not working out right, and God decides to not go with a Saul descendant lineage kingship, but to go a different direction. Uh, and we have uh, chapter 15, I think verses 10 and 11. Mm -hmm. I believe it was, uh, I think you were right with the first one, First Samuel. It is First Samuel. Mm -hmm. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. So I regret, I changed my mind. I repent of having made Saul king because how he's turned out. And, of course, he made David, another lion unconnected from him, uh, to be the righteous king over Israel. So God can change his mind. He started out with Saul. It should have gone to his sons and down the line. And then God changed his mind. But a little later in this same chapter, he says something else uh, that uh, on the surface can appear to contradict this, but not if you read it carefully, a passage that a lot of people pull out of his context to say, see, God can't repent or change his mind. Here it says so in First uh, uh, Samuel chapter 15. Mm -hmm. Verse 28, Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. So there's translated the same word as regret, mm -hmm. et cetera, it's translated literally as change his mind. And I think what he's trying to say is he just earlier said in the same passage, he changed his mind. So he's not trying to say in an absolute sense, God never changes his mind, but he's saying that God doesn't lie and change his mind like human beings do. Human beings can change their mind about something of whimsical nature, like, well, uh, I've decided I really like you, and, and 10 minutes later, I hate your guts, I don't have anything to do with you. Very quick, uh, emotion-driven, uh, irrational, uh, impetuous uh, changes of mind. And so he's just assuring Saul, yes, God has changed his mind, uh, but God doesn't both lie and change his mind the way human beings do. And then in the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 18, is a very good illustration of how and why God changes his mind. Beginning at verse 5, Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation, I warn, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider and reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. 
Yeah, and so now I translate the word repent, reconsider, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, doesn't necessarily give a literal translation, but he explains how. Uh, can I not do with you, Israel, like a potter does shaping the clay? It depends on the nature of the clay. You can't make uh, a necessarily a good piece of pottery out of a bad uh, form of clay. Um, like clay in the hands of the potter. And he gives an example. All right. If at any time God announced to a nation or kingdom, he's going to uproot them and tear them down and destroy them. And if that nation, I warn, repents, it changes their mind of its evil, then I will repent. In my translation, it says relent. That's the same Hebrew word. I will repent or change my mind and not inflict this. Vice versa, if I, on the other hand, denounce that nation or kingdom to be built up, planted, in other words, a very positive result for this kingdom, and they change their mind and repent and go from doing righteousness to evil, then I will change my mind. Uh, and I will destroy them. So, again, a very good illustration. God changes his mind when free will human beings change their mind and change their behavior. God can start off with an intent to bless and help or with an intent to punish. But if, like in the story of Jonah, when this very wicked city of the Assyrians all repent, God intended to bring destruction, he gave them a warning, they repented. God repented of destroying them. And so this is showing that, yes, God changes his mind, but not in some whimsical, well, I decided to destroy you. I don't have any good reason. I'm just going to do it because I decided to. I know I told you I was going to bless you, but I've changed my fickle mind. God isn't fickle like human beings. God has good reasons for changing his mind in terms of how he's going to deal with people, our nations and kingdom. So we just need to keep in mind, this is telling us something about the fundamental nature of God. We discovered early on in Genesis that we are given free will, that sin does not have the inherent ability to control and dominate us, but we can rule over it. But if we don't choose to do it and allow our emotions to drive us, we can end up slaves uh, to sin rather than its master. And so also we find out that God can change his mind about what he's doing because of our choice to go in a different direction, to rebel against God, and finally get to such a desperate state that God uh, decides to relent and change his mind and, in this case, wipe out most of the human race. So we have some powerful, I think, examples here uh, of how quickly uh, the creation of the Haadams went downhill and how when the women joined in this uh, abandonment, even though some men were on the righteous path, they were not able to stop uh, the direction of violence and rebellion against God, ending up with just one family worthy of divine preservation. Now, uh, as we're going to wrap up things, I think it'd be good to consider, first of all, um, how this might impact us. How might this story of the days leading up to the flood, seeing the human race going so bad, how might it have relevance for us as we think of it in reference to Jesus coming again in uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 17. Uh, Jesus had something to say about this. Beginning at verse 26, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. Yeah. So the inference, of course, from the Old Testament story uh, is that the, the human race ignored God's warning that you have a limited period of time and then there will be a destruction. And they continued on eating, drinking, just normal life, marrying, not marrying. Of course, the marrying thing reminds you of the illicit uh, relationships that took place. Uh, 
but he's saying the time before I return will be a lot like Noah's time, a time in which the human race is in deep revolt against the will of God, that uh, they are going on such a dark path that, uh, you know, there's only going to be a remnant that can be saved of this group. Uh, and uh, so God is going to come again in an environment much like the environment of Noah. And uh, as we observe our own contemporary situation, I think we can see that the world is going increasingly in the direction of evil and increasingly abandoning faith in God and a moral uh, outlook on life. And this can escalate to the point that Jesus may return in our own lifetime because of the evil that is being done. We don't know exactly when, but it'll be a time like the time of Noah, he's saying. And then the, the one last thing is, I just think it's important to realize that it tells God has feeling in this context of, of Noah. It's saying when human beings rebel against God and they sin and they, they get to where their inclination is, is always evil. When people become depraved in their heart and their lives, mm -hmm. it's not as if when they sin in this way or you and I may sin, that God simply chalks that up to rule number 126 is broken and now another rule. Uh, but instead, it breaks God's heart. God is deeply emotionally moved when he sees us going in a tragic, self-destructive uh, direction. And so we need to be mindful that God cares about what we do and is emotionally moved by it. And then we have one incident in the life of Jesus. I think we'll close with this. In the Gospel of John, chapter 11, where one of his dear friends, Lazarus, has died. Jesus arrives on the scene four days after they put his body in the tomb and is greeted by one of his sisters. And now Jesus is facing uh, the terrible calamity of death on human beings, on someone he knows well and loves. And I think uh, John 11 tells us something profound about Jesus that reflects the character of God. Beginning at verse 32. <clears throat> when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in, in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. So it says very similar expression to, uh, in the Greek, to the idea of God being very emotionally moved at the tragedy of sin and degradation on the human race in Genesis 6. Here it says, in witnessing the great tragedy of death, mm. having befallen the human race because we've abandoned God and rebelled against him, Jesus realizes he's going to be the only cure for this, the only solution. But meanwhile, before the cross and resurrection, he is face to face with the tragedy of death. The sisters that he is close to, whose brothers died, uh, are saying, if just you could have been here, this could have been prevented. Uh, and he sees them weeping, the great loss, and it says he too was deeply troubled at this scene of death. And he wept. And I think what that tells us is God is not an unfeeling uh, personality that's distant and removed from the human drama and is untouched by what we do or don't do. But both Genesis 6 and John 11 tell us that God not only cares about what we do, God is deeply emotionally touched for the tragedy we face in death. But the good news of the John passage is when we weep at the death of our loved ones and friends, we never cry alone, but God always cries with us.
And when we sin, uh, we cause God deep emotional pain, not just him seeing that we and observing that we broke a rule. And so let's remember that whether it be sin or death, uh, God is touched by these things. And God wants in Christ to restore hope, resurrection hope, a hope for immortality that he intended from the beginning. And yet he understands the great struggle of sin and death that goes on in our lives and is moved by it. May we in turn be moved by the fact that God really cares and seek to not embrace a road of sin and rebellion and instead the road of righteousness and truth so that we might have the hope of eternal life. Amen. Bruce, thank you for uh, for that uh, very deep insight into the text and to the compassion of God. And thank you all for joining us as we've continued our study of the book of origins, Genesis. Let us all pray. Righteous and eternal Father, we Lord, we just thank you for being a God who cares, who is deeply compassionate, and Father cares about us with warmth rather than the cold of an idol. We thank you for being a God of life, and Father, that you want the best for us, and you've made provision throughout time. Most importantly, your son Jesus, in whom we live, breathe, and have our existence. Father, bless us, keep us, and guide us as we seek to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Goodbye, everyone.